everybody. It's Leslie, the school programs coordinator here at the North Carolina Zoo. And welcome if it's your first time at Zoo Classroom or welcome back if you've been with us for quite a few. It's been a lot of fun, me and Nikki doing these on Thursdays for you all. Uh, so today, a couple of quick things before we get started. You can interact with people, um, the panelists and us. And the way that you do that is you were muted when you came in and you shouldn't be able to see each other um, because we have like 300, 400 people with us. So to ask us a question or to ask me a question or one of our panelists that we have helping me answer all the questions because it's really hard to answer that many people's questions, um, you're gonna put those in our Q&A box. Now on the other side, if I'm asking you a question and you have an answer to it, you're going to put that in the chat box. So your Q&A is going to be if you have questions for us and your chat is going to be if you're answering questions that we have for you. And we hope to answer as many questions as we can. So feel free to send them as we're talking about them. Um, I do have a couple of times where we may be a little bit more open with questions when I have animals out, but feel free to ask while and I'll try to answer as much as you can. Behind the camera today, I have Nikki helping me out. Hi. Hi, Nikki. <laughs> um, you see her every other week, so you know what she looks like. Um, and then we also have, I believe, Beth, Bob, um, Steve, maybe Wendy helping us out. Um, maybe some Linda's in there, Kathy's in there. We usually have a ton of people helping us out. All team, on team, I'm on deck. Um, so yeah, so now that we have that, we can go with, oh, yes, <laughs> thank you, Nikki. Nikki writes me notes, so if I like, I'm like, it's because she's writing in notes. So just a reminder, this is the last one of Zoo Classrooms for May. So make sure that you register for all of the June programs if you want to be with all the June, be here for all the June programs. Each person does have to register their own account. Um, so one person cannot register for like 50 or 100 people. Each specific computer that is logging on does need to register for itself. It is on the chat. So the love, the link yeah. for it. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, we have that on the chat now as well. So you can do that now or you can do that after the program today. We have way more fun things um, to bring you and lots more cool stuff to educate with. All right. Now that we got all that figured out, let's get started. <laughs> yeah. So today, uh, funny story. Um, when I first started at the zoo about, oh, four-ish years ago, I was tasked with making a new program. And I had gotten this idea from this really cool book I had seen, and it was called Animal Architecture. And so I started working on this program, and I was talking about it with Nikki one day, and lo and behold, lo and behold, she also had an animal architecture, architecture program that she was working on as well. So great minds think alike, right? So, so today, we're going to talk all about animal architecture. Now, what exactly, if you, if I were to say I, as a person, was, my job was an architect, what would my job be? That's my question for you all. As an architect, what what would I do? What would I? I'm gonna put that answer in chat. Yeah, in chat. Go build stuff. Build stuff like what? Yeah. Just build, build it. Build houses. You know, make stuff. Draw on the buildings. Draw, design yeah. Buildings. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So as an architect, you're doing all Hotels, those things. Yeah. Hotels, buildings. Um, what are those things that help you get from one side of a river to another side of a river, or one side of a lake to another side of the lake, or one side of a, the ocean? All right, like bridge. Bridges. Right. Bridges is a big one. Very. Lots of people have bridges. Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> True. But that is an architect can also make a boat as well. Sure. So. Um, an architect is anybody who basically like builds something um, and they it, they go through the whole entire process. It's not just physically building it. That would be more of your construction, um, your construction worker, but they have they do every single part of it. So they they think of it. They put it down on those blueprints and then they make it happen as well. So architects, here are some pretty amazing architecture. Um, does anybody know what these are? If I move up. Pyramids. Great job. Yeah. Great pyramids. Pyramid of Giza. Very They're specific. So Wonderful. Nice. And then what about this? Ooh. Oh, somebody, who is it? Who got it first? Caroline Hicks says Taj Mahal. Very nice good. Show. Taj Mahal. 
So some pretty cool things. And there's so many things that people have made that are just absolute phenomenons. And um, sometimes we also, can, as I almost fall, we, <laughs> almost, we consider them sometimes the wonders of the world. So um, mm -hmm. some pretty amazing things. Now, people are architects, but can animals be architects? That's my question for you. Are they able to think, what am I going to make and then make something? Yeah, lots of yeses. Of course, yes, yes, they are. If I, let's see, if you, if I had to ask you, when you think of uh, animal architect, what is the first type of animal that comes to your mind? All right, here we go. We got bird, beaver, ants. is going to be the first one I talk about now. All right, I've got to, uh, hold on one second. It is time for our award show, the Crafty Critters Award Show. Welcome everybody, welcome. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Leslie, School Programs Coordinator in North Carolina Zoo. I'm also your host today for the Crafty Critters Awards. Now I have, some nominees that I'm going to give you all today. And your, your purpose at our Crafty Critters Award Show is to find which one you think is your favorite, okay? And we're gonna have a nice big um, vote on it at the end and see if we can figure out, maybe hard with about 300 people, but see if we can figure out which one is gonna win. Um, and so I kind of have them split up into four nominees. So, a lot of you friends said, when you think of a crafty critter, you think of those beavers. And our first nominee today are the mammals. Everybody round of applause for the mammals. Yes, 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 yes. And in our mammal world, the first one that I think of is that beaver. Look at those butt giant teeth. Also, if you see me looking over here, it's because I'm looking at the screen to make sure it looks good. Look at those giant cheese. I like how people yes. are writing applause. Yes. So beavers, what do beavers create, everybody? What do beavers create? Dams. Dams and lodges. Dams and lodges, okay. Art. <laughs> Stuff with sticks. Stuff with sticks? Yep, yep. Yeah, so the two big things that they're going to create is that the dam and then the lodge. So, um, Miss Lynn or Miss Beth, I'm, so, I'm used to doing these programs and having Linda be my um, uh, person that does this PowerPoint. But, Miss Beth, if you could put up our first picture in our crafty critters. And here is a great view of all the things that the beaver creates. So the beaver does create that dam. And it's kind of, where does usually the beaver put the dam? Do they have a specific location that they're looking for? What do you think? Yeah, rivers, it's harder for the chat on this, but yeah. I've got, yeah. Water flows in the water, the water ends in a lake, <laughs> in the water. Yeah, those are all really great places. And a lot of times they're looking at kind of very calm flowing waters on rivers and they build that dam over the kind of from one side of the river to the other side of the river. And then all of that water on one side starts to back up and it creates a big what? What does the beaver dam actually create on the opposite side of the river? Ponds. Yeah, great job. Lakes. Ponds, lakes. 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 So beavers, beavers are literally making places for animals to live, not just themselves. They are making those rivers into ponds, into lakes, and then that's hosting a whole group of other beavers. Now, how does a beaver get the wood to the um, to the water? I mean, it could easily chew stuff that's right around. The, the area, but what if there's trees like far away? How would that beaver get a big old tree that it chewed down, down to the river? 
You can come back to me, no. um, Beth. Can you swim it there. They pull it, drag it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear something absolutely crazy? They swim it there in a way. I like that. I liked that answer. So what they'll do is they will actually dig in the ground a channel from the water to the place where that fell tree is or that tree that's down and they will let it kind of get water into that little channel and then they will put the log they'll roll the log into the channel and it'll literally float back down to the water what that's pretty amazing great job yeah great job so these guys are creating absolutely amazing areas for other animals to live. And they also even know how to create their own channels so they can easily get their, um, the, what they're making their, their dens and their lodges out of from further away. Now, does anybody want to guess how big the largest beaver dam ever found was? I will give you a hint. You can see the pond that it created from space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it looks like a big pond, but <laughs> we'll go with feet. I don't have it in uh, meters or anything oh, like that. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming up quick. 20,000, 50 miles, a million miles, 1,000 feet, 20 feet, 2,000 feet. Uh, I think that's a million. That's We're pretty feet. close. So it's about 2,800 mm -hmm. feet long that's just the dam that was created and they think it was probably like multiple um beaver families that worked together to create a 2800 foot long um dam and so what you, you can see from space is you can see the big pond area that they created with that dam um and it is in alberta canada um, but most of them are about 10 those feet canadian tall beaver. yeah those canadian viewers uh, about 10 feet tall six meters tall and about 1600 feet to, or 500 meters long. Um, also in the mammal world, another animal that does a lot of crazy digging um, is known for its huge underground tunnels. Can anybody think of a small little rodent looking animal that builds tons of tunnels underground? Moles, gophers. Moles and gophers, gophers are yeah. good guesses, but yeah. they don't build as Big of an oh, area. Oh, we got it. Let's see. Oh, crap. They're going away. Can't. <laughs> Michelle says prairie dog. Prairie dog. Good job. <laughs> I had a picture and now I don't have it anymore. Um, Is it in with the beavers? No. Well, it's that. Yeah. Th I was looking for the big picture of the prairie dog. Oh. But <laughs> prairie dogs. Um, and it, Ms. Beth, if you can put up our next picture, we'll have a good view. We should have yeah there we, go. there we go of what it looks like in a prairie dog's house now does everybody have a place where um where all the food is created and stored where's the what is that place called in your house what's that room fridge fridge yeah <laughs> what, what room is the fridge in kitchen there we go it's kitchen pantry. kitchen kitchen pantry <laughs> So yeah. the prairie dogs literally have a whole tunnel and area that's de dedicated to their quote unquote refrigerator or pantry, um, which you might, yeah, food cache, it's called a food cache on here. You can see that there's emergency exits, a front door and a back door so that they can be watching out wherever they are. And some of the cool things also are multiple bedrooms. They'll even have a nursery if there's lots of baby prairie dogs. And then my favorite, the bathroom. <laughs> prairie dogs actually do have a section that they create that is their bathroom. And they will all go down there and they will use the bathroom in that area. Now, and you can bring it back to me, Beth. Now, when when it starts to get a little smelly, how do you think they clean their bathroom? Do they clean their bathroom? What do you think they do? Exactly. That's exactly what they plug that hole and they'll build a new one. So they're not really cleaning it out, but they are at least, they're like, whoo, that smells. All right, we need to make a new bathroom. It's pretty amazing. Now, if you thought that the beaver made a giant dam and pond, prairie dogs 
are known to live in giant colonies called pounds. And the largest colony that they've ever found, which didn't have all of the parts used anymore, um, was 25,000 square miles, which is larger than West Virginia, the whole state. And they think that there was something like 400 million prairie dogs that lived there. What? That's a lot of cuteness. That's a lot of cuteness. <laughs> a lot of teeth, a lot of cuteness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't used as much anymore. And just like the beaver creates a habitat for animals that live in the pond, the prairie dog, its old tunnels actually create nice habitats for other animals that live in the area. Things like weasels and snakes and little foxes they can all live in those holes as well once the prairie dogs are gone all right friends so our first nominee the mammals we've got our beavers and prairie dogs building huge habitats that they're able to help provide safe places for other animals so our next we're nominee. <laughs> Our next nominee are the reptiles and amphibians. Woo! And with this, I actually have a friend that I want to bring out for you all. So give me one second. I got to put gloves on. So you'll notice we're wearing gloves. And the reason we're wearing gloves is actually to help protect the animals from us. And also a lot of um, our staff is currently um, kind of in separate areas and we're not able to kind of hang out with each other or be around each other. So even though we work very closely with the animal ambassador keepers, we're trying to keep our distance to kind of make sure that there's less communicate or there's not less communication, but there's less contact with us. So because of that, we were wearing gloves whenever we handle our animals. All right. Anybody want to guess? I have a little animal and now it's only little because it's a baby. It's got stripes. Their moms are some of the best moms of the reptile world. He's getting pretty big, actually. I know. Is this Cypress? It Is this Cypress or Bayou? Uh, Cypress, I think it's Cypress. So. Yeah. <laughs> Any guesses? Oh, we got a snake, iguana, alligator, gator, snake, 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 turtle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have alligator. So this is Cypress, and usually when I pick him up, um, he still gets a little nervous. So I'm gonna kind of move. <laughs> she says light eyes at Cypress. Yeah, yeah, it's Cypress. <laughs> uh, 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 Bayou has a little bit longer of a tail too. Um, so I just all of a sudden was uh -huh. like, was I right? All right, so he's nice and calm now. So I'm gonna get a little bit closer. Now there is, <laughs> there is a large microphone that's kind of up above. And so I'm gonna go really slow because I don't want him to get nervous from that. But this is Cypress. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? Too close. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. That's so perfect. Cypress is an American alligator. And he is still considered a young alligator, a baby alligator. Um, and one thing that's really amazing about alligators is they are fantastic mothers, which usually we don't think of when we think of reptiles. He is very handsome, yes. Um, so I'm going to try to show a little bit more of him. So he has these bright stripes on his body and that kind of helps him camouflage when he's in the water. Here you go, bud. Um, that helps him camouflage when he's in the water. But when they are born, they're much smaller than this. They are like hatchlings yeah hatchlings um they are about the size of like some salamanders so very very small almost like from the front legs to the back legs and that is including its tail in a lot of ways so they are so little and those eggs are so small they need a mom to help protect them and alligators will actually the mother will build a massive nest and she'll build it with twigs and mud and then she'll lay her eggs in it and very much protect it as much as she can. Because of the protection that these alligators kind of like do, um, other animals will sometimes sneak their eggs into, <laughs> into the nest as well so that their eggs are protected by the mother as well. 
Now, location is pretty key for these guys because what makes a male alligator and a female alligator is actually the temperature at which the egg is while it's developing. So the way that it works is it's hot chicks, cool dudes is kind of how we joke around with that. But mostly males are in kind of like the 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius, while females are in the more like 33 degrees Celsius or 92 degrees Fahrenheit. So the best is right in between because you'll have both males and females. Now, does anybody have any questions about my friend? Yes. How old is he? How old is he? That's, that's a great question. One of the reasons we have Cyprus is because somebody had him illegally and in an area that there were lots of alligators. And so they were a, a lot smaller than they should have been. Um, and when we got him, he looked like a hatchling. He looked like he was, oh my gosh, like months old. But we think that he's probably more into the like three-ish years. Um, maybe four-ish years, and um, he should be, he's caught up, he's pretty nice now, but he still should probably be a little bit bigger, and so we're hoping that is we continue to give him a very nutrient-enriched diet and um, a great space for him to grow into, that he will get his eventual size, which is like, what is it, average six feet to ten feet yeah. for alligators, for American alligators? Yeah, they're yeah. not super big. And that kind of, you kind of answered this question, but somebody was like, does, does a male, mother alligator live at the zoo? Oh, great question. So the mother alligator to this alligator does not live at the zoo um, because it came from somebody who had them illegally. They were, it was already away from its mother. Um, and alligators do live usually with their mom for about two-ish years. And then the mom's kind of like, yeah, get out. I don't want to take care of you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't live with them for forever. Do they call their mom, mother often? The, a great question. So um, on the phone? <laughs> they have their phone number. So Cyprus um, does kind of make that noise, which I'm going to try to make it. So don't judge me, everybody. <laughs> it sounds like a, a puppy. Yeah. Like so a puppy. <laughs> um, some people are better at it than I am, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and he does make that noise sometimes but I don't necessarily think he thinks a mom is coming. I think he just makes it to kind of, that's the noise he feels he should, he thinks instinctually he should be making. Um, because usually what it is is when they're babies, the mom will come running and protect them and save them. But if he hasn't had a mom come and protect him, then he's just kind of making that noise instinctually, which means instinct just means like, just it's wired in his brain that that's what he's supposed to do in certain situations what does he eat great question what does he eat so we can feed him things like fish mice um are the big ones and is there anything else that we feed him my my uh friends behind the scenes those are the biggest those are the biggest two things that we feed him mm -hmm. fish yeah. and mice mm -hmm. And they can actually, they can be target trained. So these guys, um, uh, when they're, you can start when they're young or you can even start with their old, they're smart enough that you can take a um, target and eventually train them to come up to that target. And they know that that's where they're supposed to be fed or that's how they're supposed to be fed. And that's actually how we feed our adult alligators at the zoo. So wants to know, does he bite? Great question. So I'm gonna try to get a little, so you can just see some cool thing. Yeah. Um, he's looking, he's looking at that. <laughs> uh, so does he bite? Oh, um, so he does have a mouth. We see that nice big mouth and actually crocodiles, um, have the strongest bite force of any animal and alligators are not, they're not that far behind. They do have incredibly strong bite force, but he only feels like he has to bite if he's nervous or if he feels like he needs to protect himself. And one of the first ways we would know that he was really nervous, the moving sometimes tells us, but also the moving could be that he's just not in a comfortable spot. And so I'm trying to put him in a comfortable spot. But one of the biggest ways he could tell us is if he has that mouth wide open, which he just did. <laughs> he saw me do this. 
which some alligators are trained, you know, some things are trained to do that, but that was my fault. And I got my hand a little bit too close to him. Um, so alligators and animals, you have to be very careful when you're working with them because everything that you're doing could be something that kind of scares them or gets them a little bit nervous. And so because he is opening his mouth a little bit, I'm probably gonna put him back um, and let him be in an area that he finds a little bit more safe. Yeah. So I guess while you're doing that, I can answer this one. So sure. um, someone's asking, most reptiles don't need their mothers when they're born, but do alligators need their mom or mothers when they are born? And yes, <laughs> absolutely. Because they're so small, they're like this big, they're very easily on the mi menu for lots of animals. And so even other alligators, even other alligators unfortunately. So um, having the mom really helps them get to a size where they can truly protect themselves from predators. Did we have any other questions about uh, alligators? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Can alligator from crocodile part of the smoothie with it. Yes, 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 you can. Um, now there's the age old joke that one you see in a while and one you see later, which is always a fun joke, but there is truly a way that you can tell them apart. And in fact, I have an alligator or a crocodile. <laughs> so we're, we're actually in a room where most of our bio facts live, which makes this really fun and easy that I could just go and get this. So this is a crocodile skull. And then oh, somebody has a question, how big are their brains? So that'll, that's a really good way of showing <laughs> the skull. <laughs> not very big. Yeah, they're not very big. It's no. like here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right there. That's pretty much it. Um, so here you have your alligator and your crocodile. Which one do you think is, is which? Raise your hand if you think, or raise your hand. <laughs> Say it in the chat if you think this is. I put that number one. Number, number one, one, number one is, do you think number one is the alligator or do you think number two is the alligator? One, two, 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 one, two. Or a mix of both. Mm -hmm. One, two, one, two, one. Yeah, it's a whole mix. So can anybody tell me why they picked what they picked? How they were able to tell the difference? I want to see if anybody already knows it. Oh, U versus V. Great job, Aaron. U shaped alligator, V shaped crocodile. U shaped alligator, V shaped crocodile. So, and if you see the actual live animal, alligators only their top layer of teeth are visible outside of the mouth, while crocodiles both their top and their bottom teeth are visible outside of the mouth. So a lot of times people say that crocodiles look a little bit more scary because they have so many more visible teeth, which is kind of cool. Great job team, great job. So still with, we're still with our reptiles and amphibians. And the other, um, the other animal that I wanted to talk, to talk about are frogs that create foam nests. So what they're actually able to do, now I can't find where I put it. Yeah, thank you. Foam nests. Um, some amphibians are able to create these foam nests. And in the foam nest will be their eggs. Now, where do you think they make these foam nests? Do you think they make them in the water? Do you think they make them on the plants right near the water, up way up in trees? Where do you think the frogs make these foam nests? Trees, in the trees, branches, trees, yep. Yeah, so in branches and trees, and some of the ones that actually make these foam nests are actually tree frogs. So they live in the trees. And then some of them will lay them kind of right over the branches of um, the area where the water is. And then the coolest thing about that is what they're able to do is they use kind of this, we'll call it like a fluid, like a water type thing, but it it's, has a specific name. I just don't know what it's called. But females have kind of this fluid that they're able to kick and use the pond water with, and it creates a foam. What do you think this foam does for the eggs? Why do you think this foam is beneficial for the frogs? It does protect them. Yeah. It protects them, 
So actually, cool, the cool thing you said keeps it warm. It actually helps keep it cooler. It helps protect it from the harsh tropical sunlight. Keeps them moist. Keeps them moist. And then it keeps it a little bit further away from the water or in an area that it's harder for animals to find them and eat them. Um, so the foam nest tree frog is a big one that does this and animals are less likely to kind of go after it because it just looks like this foam. So our reptiles and amphibians, we have our big old alligators that are great mothers that are able to protect um, their their offspring to a point that other animals are trying to get in on that protection by laying their eggs in their um, nests. And then we have those foam, foaming nest tree frogs that are able to kick up and protect the eggs um, in trees and around the water. All right, our next nominee, what? Frubbles? Did I say frubbles? No, no, that's oh. not a good way to do word for us. That is, bubbles. oh, uh, I would, that is something I would totally do is say the wrong word. So like, <laughs> I was like, oh, did I say it? Like that, that sounds like something I said, but I like frubbles. So how I'll, do they make it? I guess that's the oh, how do they make it? Yeah. So like I said, that there's, there's kind of like um, a fluid that the female already makes but then they use that and then the pond water and then they actually kick it together to kind of, you know, if you shake up water or you shake up like soda, it makes all those bubbles and it becomes kind of frothy. So it's very similar. There's proteins in it that cause it to be kind of frothy. And when they kick, they're able to incorporate air into it and it makes those bubbles. It's pretty crazy kind of like to watch. Cream. We had to like whipped cream yeah. <laughs> or like um, kind, well, no, never mind. I was gonna say like the ice cream you made in Zoo Science, not exactly, but <laughs> but we did have to shake that a lot yeah. and introduce stuff into it. Does the uh, foam, foam nest dry out? Um, so eventually it would dry out, yes, but it dries out, it would dry out after the babies are usually hatched and they are tadpoles and then they um, either, they're able to stay in there as tadpoles if it's like in a tree and then they become frogs or they drop into the water as tadpoles as well. So it depends on the frog. But yes, it definitely would after a certain amount of time, especially if it was in like direct sunlight um, for a long time of the day, it could definitely dry up. All right, so we our first two um, nominees for our crafty critters are our mammals and our reptiles and amphibians or our herp herpafauna is what they would be called. Fancy little name, herpafauna. Next is going to be our insects. Now, there are tons of cool things that invertebrates do, but I picked two today that I really wanted to talk to you about because I think they're super amazing. So, um, has anybody heard of a caddisfly? And if so, what's special about it? Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> that's a nose. Nope. <laughs> Not a popular animal. But very cool. I dropped stuff. Don't pay attention to me. <laughs> so a caddis fly is this tiny, tiny, tiny little fly. Now this is, we got some good light. Is that good? Come a little bit closer. Yeah. So a caddis fly is a tiny little fly, and they're everywhere. They're, most people don't even know they exist because they're super small, they're on almost habit, any, every habitat, and they're pretty um, indiscreet. Like they don't really do a lot of things that would make us not like them, they just fly around. But one of the cool things about caddisflies is that they go through those stages of metamorphosis, so they have a larva stage. And during their larva stage, they live in the water. And what they do is they take kind of like their spit and anything that's around them, they will stick to their bodies to make like a cocoon or, or pupa is what we would call it. So they will take, if it's rocks, they'll take rocks. And they create, ooh, sorry, coming out too fast. Um, they take those and then they stick them all together. Now, this is a very blown up picture of it. This is usually, they're super, super small, and I'll actually show you a real one. So um, they make with, they make this pupa all around them with that right here. There we go. It's hard to tell because it's, yeah, there's a glare. Hold it up a little bit. Oh, the 
microphone's in the way. There we go. <laughs> there you go. This is so fun, these angles that I have to do. Yeah. Um, so it makes this, this pupa, and then it metamorphs or becomes a butterfly, or but not a butterfly, a <laughs> caddisfly, and then it leaves that behind, that pupa behind. Now, with some of it, since the rocks may be beautiful in the area that they are, the, the pupa itself is quite beautiful. And a French artist said, you know what? I found these animals and they make, he's, he's probably speaking French when he's saying this, but I can't speak French. <laughs> he's probably, he's probably, he's sitting there, oh, you know, they, they make this, they, they, they leave this pupa behind. What if I put in things like, pearls or gold or beautiful gems would they actually take those and then create the pupa around them what do you think do you think that they were like no nope, those aren't the rocks that we need or they were like yeah give me whatever's around me yes <laughs> they sure did yeah they made beautiful pupas and now i can't remember um Beth, if I had a picture of that or not, I think I did. <laughs> yep, and up close. They made, so yeah, they made these beautiful pupas and then people were able to take the empty pupas and then create jewelry out of them. So here's some kind of like beautiful caddisfly jewelry that people can buy and it's made from an actual animal and the caddisfly doesn't need it anymore. So once, it's not like they went and they took the caddis fly out of it. It's just kind of what is left behind. Pretty amazing, right? And I also, if you want to come back to me, Beth. Now, Mr. Steve, who is a, one of our people who's talking, he has a wonderful wife named Lee, who also works at the North Carolina Zoo. And she actually has some. So I asked if she would let me borrow it for today. And here, as I drop something. I'm very clumsy, if you guys haven't so noticed. Yeah, so that would be cool. They're actually, um, just like a butterfly, when they leave their pupa, they leave it behind. So they don't need it anymore. So yeah. they're not harming the animals. They're not harming the animals. So the pupa is only, they only need it during that stage. So once they are out of that stage, the pupa is just left behind. There's absolutely nothing in it. So they're able to have the caddis fly, watch it, and then they're able to take it after it becomes a fly and goes and lives the rest of its life. So yeah, it's really neat kind of some of the things that you can find that are made by animals that you can use for jewelry. Pretty amazing, right? I have quality earrings. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do have quality earrings. <laughs> But we're also the weirdos that buy weird things. Yeah, so. <laughs> Which does lead. So somebody um, wants to know, how did you become zookeeper? And I have no idea if you still are a zookeeper. <laughs> are me? Us. Yeah, I guess that's what they want. Something Beth told us to answer this online. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so I personally, I'm not a zookeeper by name. Um, I have been a keeper in the past. I worked at a small nature center in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I took care of native animals. Um, but I have been mostly an educator in my adulthood. I worked at an aquarium as a, an exhibit educator and the coordinator of it. And then I worked as um, like a programs coordinator at the lasso. And then here I'm the school programs coordinator. Though I do work with animals and my past training with keep being a keeper has really helped me. My title is school programs coordinator. I am an educator and not a keeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody wants to know what do they look like when they come out of the people? Oh yeah, that was the first picture, picture I had. There, there we go. <laughs> I don't want to go over in that corner anymore, right? <laughs> Guys, I, I trip over everything. <laughs> All right, so here's the picture the adult. of the adult. And I mean, they're like, you know, this big. They're not very big at all. All right, now, not to be biased or anything, the next insect is my favorite animal architect. Don't let that persuade you in your answer. 
So in our category of crafty critters and our nominee, the insects, our next one is the termite. Now, you may have heard some things about termites. Can anybody tell me anything about African termites and why they're such a crafty critters? Hmm. Mounds? They do build mounds. <laughs> so I'm I'm going to talk specifically about African um, our termites that are in Africa. So they are a lot different than the termites that we have around here and how they build their houses. Um, the termites around here are a little bit more pest-like and they can destroy your house. While the termites in Africa um, are uh, they don't they're not really pests or anything like that. Oh, this is hot. <laughs> All right, so Miss Beth, I believe if you can put up my next picture, I should have a termite mound. This is what a termite mound looks like in Africa. And you can see there's a giraffe. Now that giraffe's probably for a little further behind, so it looks even smaller than it can be. But they are really, really large, really, really tall. Um, and the African termites will build these mounds, millions of them live in, in the mound, and they build them in a very specific um, direction. They want it so that the way that it's built in this chimney-like shape, that it gets the least amount of sun on it during the hottest part of the day. And because of that, they also have this kind of chimney in the middle. So if Beth, if you can go to my next picture. The inside of that termite mound is shaped in a way that they're able to open and close little holes throughout the sides of it all day long. And then the air is able to circulate either in and then straight up, all the hot air straight up and out, or it's able to keep hot air in at night when it's really, when it can be cold at night. And because of this, termites are actually really efficient. It is pretty amazing. And us as people, we have seen how termites are able to create this kind of like self-containing air condition system that, you know, they don't pay electric bills, so they're not plugging it in somewhere to keep it cool in there or to keep it warm in lower areas at night. They're literally just using physics and how the air circulates. And people looked at that and modeled a mall after it. So if Beth, you can go to my next picture. There is a mall in East, it's called Eastgate Mall, and it's in Zimbabwe, which is in Southeast Africa. And this is what the plans, the blueprints kind of look like of that mall. And you can see that the way they, they have the windows and the chimneys at the top, as the air comes in the sides, it's able to go, the hot air is able to go straight up through the chimney and out, keeping them at a specific degree throughout the day. And they also even put, um, they also even put plant life on the outsides to help keep the sun away as well. So this mall is able to use only 10 percent of the amount of energy a mall its size would use like here in in North America. Pretty amazing, right? And it's all based off a tiny little termite. All right, did I have one more picture, Beth? I can't remember. Of, did I have a picture of the mall? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Nope, nope not. I did not. <laughs> I it, it looks like a very large mall, basically. It's kind of pinkish in color. I do, I do have it. Somewhere. Um, so, nope, I don't think I brought it with me. Okay. That's fine. Um, <laughs> with your parents, you can look up Eastgate Mall, Zimbabwe. Um, and it, I mean, it, it just looks like a big building, basically. But it is pretty amazing how it does that. So our insects, we have basically a decorator that's a, an exterior decorator that's able to make a beautiful um, pupa to survive in that people have been able to use what they leave behind um, as art. And then we have the termites that literally changed how we as people looked at air conditioning and created a whole entire mall out of it. It's pretty amazing. All right, so for our last 
Crafty Critter nominee, we have the birds. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to talk really quickly about a bird, and then we're going to meet one of our friends, the birds. Um, and so, uh, Beth, can you bring up our next picture? Now, this bird is also a great decorator. This is called a bower bird. And you can kind of see it in the kind of top right corner or top left corner. Uh, it's a pretty small bird that's able to actually construct these beautiful nests. Now, one of the coolest things about them is that they will pick whatever decoration that they think is the best. And basically it's the men are trying to kind of say, hey ladies, come look at my beautiful house. Don't you want to be um, my, my girlfriend or my wife? Um, and they have been known to organize them in ways like if you see that big picture, all the oranges are together, all the blues are together, and it's this huge, it's, um, it's this huge area for them to kind of like show off. And then some of them will only pick one color or like my favorite one. Anybody out there have a messy room? I'm raising my hand right now. I have an incredibly messy room like all the time. <laughs> some bower birds even just throw stuff everywhere. <laughs> and they just create like a messy area. <laughs> so it all depends on that bower bird, kind of what they're looking at. But weaving is a very amazing thing that birds can do. So Beth, if you can go to our next slide. I believe it's my other weavers. Maybe. <laughs> oh no, it might be frozen. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> So the other type of really cool bird that kind of does this epic weaving, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> that is a huge nest, isn't it? <laughs> so um, this is the huge nest that should be on the screen are our sociable weavers. Are, some, some, are we still spotlit maybe? I think they might be seeing Taylor right now instead. Do you guys see pictures of nests or do you see Nikki with an owl? <laughs> nests, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just broke the snow. No, no, sorry. <laughs> well, go to the people. That's fine. <laughs> um, so those big nests are weaver birds and they're small little birds, but they live in a huge colony. So since they live in a huge colony, they're able to make these elaborate, um, nests where multiple live in them but they've been so large if you see the first picture that is a that's just one giant nest it's on a um one pole that's not a tree so they create this weave this owl or weave this nest and then the one next to it you can see it kind of takes a little bit of a different shape and some weaver birds have made nests so big that the trees eventually like almost topple over because they become so heavy. <laughs> but they can be over 20 feet or six meters wide and 10 feet or three meters tall. Pretty amazing. All right, Beth, if you could come back to us. <laughs> and surprise! Some of you may have seen her. <laughs> so, Don't get too close. She's afraid of that microphone. She, yeah. Does Who's anybody it? has anybody been in this before and seen her before and remember who that was? Yes. Do you remember her name? <laughs> she's very focused on the food. She's very good. She's very focused. This is Tara. Well, great job, Joe. That's Tara. Yes. Yeah. Um, Nicole. Um, Nicole. Um, and so this it's is like Tara. Person. And. The she thing seems about Tara, super focused on the food, so she's not she's very focused on Nikki and the food right now. She's um, not noticing the microphone yet. There is a mic that gets her a little bit nervous, so we're gonna make sure that she stays comfortable as possible. She, yeah, she's very focused on something else, and now she sees you guys. <laughs> so you may see Nikki move back. Yeah, I don't want to get too close to it. Yeah, your microphone. Uh, so a lot of people have said it after she's a barred owl. She is a barred owl, and owls are pretty amazing. Um, they, a lot of times owls actually, the nest that they make, they're cavity nesters. So they, um, 
they make a nest that is already an old tree, but the biggest one nest ever made was by a bird of prey, and that was the bald eagle, with which, um, Beth, if you could show us our last slide, and then we'll come back to Tara and answer all the questions, we promise. <laughs> A bald eagle made a nest that was almost 10 feet or three meters wide and 20 feet or six meters deep. And it weighed more than two tons. That's about 400, 44,000, yeah, 4,400 pounds, 4,400 pounds. And the thing is, is when they make this, they come back from year to year, just like the owls go back to the cavities year to year, but things like great horn owls, they also make nests as well. So this nest was absolutely huge, and it's the largest and heaviest nest oh, from an owl that was ever created. Um, all right, Beth, if you can come back to Miss Tara. Broke the tree, too. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it did. It's trying to get to the tree. <laughs> all right. All right, so we do have some questions, and since Nikki is in Toronto, is, are you fine with answering Sure. These questions. We you. have a lot of questions about her eye. How would you not? I know. What's going Good on? observations, right? She is missing an eye. Um, so Miss Tara, she came to our zoo, oh, was it 2002? Long time ago. Um, she came to our hospital at the zoo because she was injured. And so they're not sure how she got injured. She either got hit by a car or by, we don't really know for sure. That's probably our best guess. And she had an eye injury and a little bit of a wing injury, too. And so her eyes just, she could never fully see out of that eye. And so she needs both eyes to see how far away stuff is. So flying through the trees at night, trying to hunt food down, very hard. You need to have that depth perception, see how far away things are. So she couldn't pass any tests to be able to release her back in the wild. And by test, I mean we put her in an enclosure to see if she could catch live food and she couldn't do it because she doesn't have that depth perception. So she couldn't release back in the wild. And that's why she's with us. And over years, she actually had an eye for a long time. When I first started working with her, um, she had her eye was in, but it kind of, she somehow injured it and it got kind of infected and was causing her a lot of pain. And they made the decision to remove it so that she wouldn't have any more pain and we wouldn't have to keep Bring her to the hospital. So good question, good observations, guys. A lot of people want to know how old she is. Well, we're guessing. So she came to us in 2002. So she, we know she's at least 18, but probably older than that. So 20-ish, possibly. We don't know for sure. But she was an adult when she came in. So. All right. Um. Oh, there was one question. Now it's gone. But it's, it was, <laughs> do all owls come out at night? Or are all, um, all owls not? Good question. And no. Not all owls are nocturnal. We've got, um, if you come to our zoo and you go to the desert, um, burrowing owls, they're what we call diurnal owls. Uh, I think even snowy owls are diurnal too. So it's several different species of owls actually more active during the daytime. Good and um, Carrie or Carrie would like to know, can their heads really spin all the way around? Oh, you missed our Mythbuster. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you yeah. have to go back and watch it. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we, we bust that myth in that program. They can go pretty close, but not all the way around. If they went all the way around, their head would pop off, and they wouldn't do that. It's about 270 degrees. So she can come, and she can look over her back, and then look over this shoulder. Whereas we can only go, what, 90 degrees? But she can go a lot farther than we can, that's for sure. Um, we did also get asked how many owls that you, we have at the zoo, and is she the owl? Anna would like to know, is she the owl that's in the stream side? Oh, that's a good question. So she is not. That is a different owl. Um, so, because she is what we call an ambassador, so she, because uh, that owl over there, they really don't do program with her, she, they're a little, I mean, they work with her and train her, but she actually goes and travels, she used to travel around the state, and so we had to do a lot more work with her to get comfortable with that, so she's off public view, so the only time you get to see her is during programs, and occasionally she comes out at Kid Zone and gets to greet people there too, so. So she is not the one who streams it. Good question. Though. All right, one more Good question. Option. So Jesse would like to know what is their life expectancy? Ah, so in the wild, 10 to 15 years, but because she gets free food, free health care, all that good stuff, she may live to be well up in her 20s to 30s. We hope. Fingers crossed because <laughs> we love Tara. She's awesome. 
Um, just because I saw this real quick, somebody asked mm -hmm. if you can have a pet apple. Yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> it's illegal. It is illegal. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely illegal. You can't even have a feather. Right. So birds are protected under the Migratory Bird Act, and you can't even have a feather. Anything from a bird. <laughs> so she's looking she's at looking that. At that yeah. yeah, she's like, what she's is that microphone? She's she was awesome today. She's our rock star. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to come hang out around here. Do you want me to put her uh, up? Yeah. Or I'm going to put her up. going to go put her up because she's doing such a great job. And we want to end on an incredibly positive note, which um, she looked at that that microphone and she didn't get nervous around it. And so that is super awesome. We're going to give her tons of food. She went straight in. Gosh, she's so smart. So one of the other questions that we had were why would an eagle have to build a nest that big? And that's a really great question. I don't know exactly the answer to that, but my educated guess would be because they use it from year to year to year, they go still kind of go through that behavior of wanting to create a nest. And so they will continue to add to the nest as much as they can. Um, also, because they want to make sure their babies stay nice and safe. At, um, eagles aren't like super heavy by any means, but they're still a pretty heavy bird of prey. So they want to make sure there's a nice structure for their babies to stay safe in, to move around in, and even when they get to like the fledgling size that they can jump off of and fly, or they can move around in, and that's more than one as well. So and great. It's several generations of bald eagles. Yeah, too. several That's generations of bald eagles. Yeah, so they want it to, to withstand basically the test of time. So all of these animal crafty critters are super <laughs> cool. Those are our nominees. We had mammals, where we had the beavers and prairie dogs. We had reptiles and amphibians, where we had the alligators and the foaming nest frogs. We had insects with the caddis flies and the termites, and then birds with bower and weaver birds and birds of prey. So everybody vote for your favorite who's gonna win is it mammals is it reptiles and amphibians is it insects is it birds so just general mammal reptiles and amphibians insects or birds those are the the nominees <laughs> after this because Nikki is definitely a bird nerd so oh, she may be uh she may be <laughs> just kidding I guess. so it looks like our winner today is birds for the craftiest of critters and you know what birds are amazing we only talked about two that had pretty crazy nests but there are so many birds out there that have just absolutely amazing nests or they have absolutely amazing architecture that they make. Now, the reason that I wanted to kind of have some fun today and learn about some animal architects is because a lot of times when we think of animals and we think of maybe the nest they have or anything like that, we have a very specific vision in our head. Like birds always have this type of bird nest. Reptiles never have nests insects are just we they're gross and we don't like them but all of these animals need to be protected because biodiversity is so important so learning all these different types of nests and architectures that are architecture that animals make we can know to help when we see it that we can help protect it and you know not try to hurt it or anything like that i don't know about you but i love a big pile of leaves and i want to go and kick it right but Maybe if you're in an area where there's lots of alligators and something looks like a big fun thing to kick, a big pile of leaves, you'll say, wait a minute, I know alligators make these really big mounds and that the mothers are very protective. And then you'll take a step back and say, we need to be, we need to not go over there. So knowing as much as we can about our amazing crafty critters will definitely help us protect them and protect the habitats that they are in. So friends, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and making our birds our number one crafty critters and our crafty critter awards we will see you next time and be safe have a great day bye everybody